The survey had sort of five key areas that it was looking at. So the contribution to the economy, so finances and size of turnover, those sorts of questions. We were looking at training and background accessibility and routes into the sector. We were also looking at the way in which people talk about their work. Uh, so in terms of the languages they use, the terminology that they use. And then we were also looking at starting to understand the demographic of some of those audiences who comes to this work. And then the other thing we were looking at is what people really, what challenges and barriers do they have to making their work? And so those were the five key areas that we focused on in the survey. Then the survey showed us where we had potentially some gaps um, in what came back. And then we held the focus groups to get some more granular detail on some of those gaps that came up during the survey. Some of the findings that we found really came to light in the focus group. But even before that stage, there were some things that really surprised us that we were seeing just in the data from the survey. One of the questions that we asked was, what do you credit your entry in the sector to? So we were asking people to pick one part of their journey into working in the immersive industry and, and frame that as one of the key drivers for their entry into the sector. And what we started to see was up to around a third of people who responded said that they got there through some personal connection Mm. or through having the ability to take on an unpaid placement or unpaid work. Um, yeah. This really revealed to us a massive access issue, which we hadn't had an idea of, but really hadn't put into you know, the form of statistics and data before. No. And I think it was much more significant than either of us thought. Yeah, well. anecdotally, we had a sense that that was probably the case, but this was really stark. And the other thing that was even more stark is those who did have a qualification that's, that on the surface looks like it was the access into the sector. Actually, what we found was that mostly they were training, well, the people that responded, were training in theatre or in directing or acting or something, or game design, something associated. But actually, it wasn't their qualifications or their training that actually got them into the sector. It was those personal contacts. Yeah. And so we were surprised by the data that came out of the survey and even more surprised than when we started to dig into that in the focus groups. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we kind of concluded off the back of that sort of finding as well is one of the ways to elevate the immersive sector is not by removing the reliance on those personal connections no. at all, <laughs> but just increasing the access to those networks, to places yes. where people can meet each other. So thinking about the strategy for seeing that as an obstacle and, and finding a solution for it that didn't just mean assuming it was going to be eradicated, basically. Another really interesting thing that we found was uh, in the finances section of the survey, we asked people what split of funding they currently use when they're creating new work. So we gave them options such as uh, public grants and funding, the profits from previous shows, their own personal finances as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question that we asked them was in their ideal business strategy or in the next, in the, in the trajectory of their professional life, what would their ideal funding split look like for new work? Mm -hmm. And I think before we did the survey, anecdotally, we assumed that a lot of the industry was relying on public grants and funding and would want to continue to rely on public grants and funding, but we're just looking for a way to make that funding more accessible to immersive as its own sector. But actually what we got back from the survey was that many more people were interested in seeking private investment and routes to private funding than we thought. We had this idea that there was maybe some hesitation about um, taking on a corporate investor or making a partnership with a private funder, seeing it put into data and seeing that so many more people did intend to include private investment in their future funding yeah. made a, a massive difference to the way that we looked at um, how the IEN might be able to support people in terms of accessing funding, that actually less of the effort than we expected might need to be on making public grants more accessible, even though yeah. it is still important. And much more of it might be on finding ways to connect potential commercial investors yeah. to those creators. So we did the initial survey 
Um, and that gave us lots of really interesting kind of um, surface statistics. But there were lots of aspects of it like entry, uh, like audiences, like finances and funding that we still didn't have um, a very clear picture on. And so we had a series of focus groups. We had three different focus groups where we started to dig down into some of those statistics and some of the answers that we got back to sort of unravel them a little bit more in detail. We grouped people together that had much more in common with their business practices than with the kind of work they produced. So essentially we started with a half and half split between people who work as freelancers and sole traders. Their business practices tends to be across, across genres, across types of companies. Yes. And then people who have larger or longer established companies, which as you say, could also just be a single person that yeah. had a very different business practice from people operating as freelancers. Yes. And then we took that second group and then we further split them by those working in London and those working outside of London. It was useful to split the focus groups that way. Yes. And it did show us that there were some differences in perspective, mm -hmm. some that we were expecting and some that we were not. Yeah. But I think one of the findings that we have coming out is how important it now is to make sure that those dialogues can cross those splits we put in. Yes. Make sure that the places where small companies or freelancers might disagree with brand partners and the largest companies um, can also help them to collaborate better together. And I think one of the interesting things we found in the focus groups was the, the difference in perspective on um, hiring practice accreditation and things like that mm. that was almost amplified by the fact that these sort of groups of people don't necessarily speak to each other, that the sole traders, the freelancers, the micro organisations interact and understand each other, yes. but don't necessarily interact with and understand the larger companies who are actually looking for them and looking yes. for their support. <laughs> Absolutely. And so that, again, is really useful insight for us as IN, because it means we can start to tailor events to make sure that those dialogues continue and to make sure that those people are brought into rooms to share and to meet each other, because the focus group showed us that that's a really valuable thing outside of kind of the research questions. The focus group showed us that that was a really valu valuable thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm.